Revelation chapter 2, verses 8 through 11. If you try, open your Bibles there. I've been assigned uh, the church in Smyrna. This is one of the two churches of Asia that had nothing negative directed toward those congregations. This, this is one of the two. And if you have two out of seven, that's a little over 28% that were faithful to the Lord. 28%. When you think about statistics and numbers and you look at things like this, you know, the Bible says many are called and few are chosen. This kind of indicates that. How many people were on the ark in Noah's day? Out of the millions that were there, eight people out of that. Uh, Matthew chapter 7, verse 13 and 14, the two, the, the, the narrow uh, straight gate and the broad way and the wide gate, uh, many there be, in, be that enter in thereat, and few there be that find it. So we see here uh, the parable of the sower, the good soul, bad soul, two types of soul. But when we sow the seed, uh, it indicates one out of four response. Favorably. Now, that's not necessarily a hard, fast rule, but we can see from these examples that when we think about the number of people that are actually standing for the truth and, and actually doing the will of the Lord, we're always going to be in the minority. It's always been that way. Just study the Old Testament prophets. Look at the book of Acts. Uh, and again, over and over, we see this same... Uh, pattern, this same idea that the faithful are always the few. And we always talk about sometimes the faithful few. Well, the Bible teaches that. It indicates that that's the way it's going to be. The world has a strong hold on a lot of people. Even among our own brethren, the, the pull of the world is strong. And we'll pull some who have been seeming faithful for years. They're not immune to this problem that the world has to, to pull them away, that Satan's working on them all the time, constantly trying to figure out what, they can, what Satan can do to tempt us away from the truth, away from God, away from those that are in fellowship with God. I like the theme of this lecture, studying the seven churches of Asia, these epistles, these letters to those seven churches, and how it relates to fellowship. We need to keep in mind that as we study these lessons, the application is, how does this uh, letter to this church relate to fellowship in the overall scheme of things? And so we're going to read our text, and then we're going to come back, make some comments on it, and as we go along, we're going to make some application as it relates to fellowship. We turn to, to Revelation 2, beginning in verse 8, and under the angel of the church in Smyrna, write these things, says the first and the last, uh, which was dead and is alive, I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich, and I know the blasphemy of them uh, which say they are Jews and are not, but are, are the, but are the synagogue of Satan. Fear none of those things which ye shall suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. He that has ears, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcomes shall not be hurt of the second death. You know, when we think about the church at Smyrna. It was located inland. Uh, it was an inland seaport about 50 miles north of Ephesus, located in Ionia, uh, named for the Ionians who captured the city in 688 B.C. Uh, it had a turbulent history. It had been destroyed once by the king of, of Lydia in 580 B.C. Nearly 400 years later, uh, the city was rebuilt. Uh, Smyrna surrendered to Rome in 133 B.C., and so they were under Roman rule. Uh, like Ephesus, Smyrna was known for emperor worship, they had a temple there for the emperor, people to go in and, and uh, pay tribute to uh, the emperor of Rome. Uh, Polycarp, the bishop of Smyrna, was a disciple of John and uh, was martyred in a great theater that was built uh, in this city that seated about 22,000 people. Uh, they claimed to be the birth uh, place of the poet Homer, 
and even had a, a building called the, a temple called the Homerian where you could go and pay tribute to Homer if you so desired. I uh, had a great citadel there called the Golden Lion Palace. Uh, it's a fairly large Jewish population and today is known as Ishmir in Turkey. And so again, a, a long history for this city. Uh, the Lord's Church established there. Uh, even amongst the wickedness and the debauchery of this uh, city. It was a prosperous city. Uh, very wealthy people lived there. But it's interesting when we think about this, uh, the church, the brethren, are known as people that were in poverty. And, uh, but, they, but yet it says they were rich. And so we're going to talk about that in just a little bit. You know, in this lesson, we're going, to co we're going to consider a few things. The first thing we want to talk about is what God knows. What God knows. You know, in uh, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 13, verse 12 and 13. Verse 12 talks about the word of God is quick and powerful as a two-edged sword, dividing even asunder the joints and marrow and, and soul and spirit. But then it goes on and talks about God. The one that knows us, uh, who that we are an open book before. He knows all about us. And he's the one that it says that we have to do. He knows us. And it's illustrated here that God, as, as Brother Lickie pointed out, God knows us. And you know, that ought to, when we think about fellowship issues, you know, we need to realize that God knows who we're in fellowship with. Whether we're in fellowship with the righteous or the wicked, God knows that. We can't hide it from Him. You know, even some people think, well, you know, uh, maybe I, I have this sin and nobody knows about it. The preacher doesn't know about it. The elders don't know about it. Maybe my friends and family, nobody knows about it. But, you know, even you can get it past all of us human beings. But you're never going to get your sin past God because He knows everything about us. Notice here some things that God knew about the church at Smyrna. He said, I know their works. Think about that. He knew their works. And, and, and God knows not only the congregation here, their works, but he knows the individual works too. Have you ever thought about the depth of God's knowledge about what you do? Think about that. You, you, God knows everything you do, whether good or bad, but he knows their works these were acceptable works. I know they were acceptable works because God didn't charge them with any sin. In Hebrew, or Acts chapter 10 and verse 35. Everybody of every nation that does righteousness is accepted of God. It doesn't matter where you're from. doesn't matter your skin color. It doesn't matter how big your, your wallet is. Mine's not very big. It's kind of thin. But, you know, it doesn't matter about, doesn't matter your level of education you could be highly educated you could be illiterate it doesn't matter god knows your works and god isn't interested in who you are he's not interested in what color your skin is he don't care where you're from he doesn't care how much money or education you have but he knows your works he only, he's interested in how well you're educated in this book right here this is the education that's important he wants us to be what? He wants us to know what this book is, to study it, to learn it, to do it, and teach it to others. That's our responsibility. That's all God wants of us. That sounds pretty simple, doesn't it? But I'll tell you what, it's very hard to do. Remember the numbers we talked about earlier, the statistics about how many are going to be saved, how many lost, how many faithful, how many unfaithful? Even though it's a simple task that God has set before us, it's still very hard for us to do. And so when we think about works, our works need to be good works, works of righteousness. Everybody has works. But we need to make sure that our works conform to God's word. We need to have works of faith. You know, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 3, Paul said of, their, of those brethren at Thessalonica, he says, I remember... And he said, unceasingly, he says. In other words, he always thought about these things regarding those brethren. These are what they were known for. And he says, their, their work of faith. 
See, the work of faith, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. So their works were in line with the word of God. They were doing what they did by faith. And he goes on and talks about their labor of love. Jokingly, a while ago, Jeff and, and Buddy were talking about love, right? Jesus said, what? If you love me, see, Buddy's quoting that. If you love me, keep my commandments. See, my labor of love. When we think about the commandments of God that we receive through Jesus Christ in the New Testament, there's two senses in which we respond to those and two ways we can look at them. You can look at those commandments as obligations. I have to do that. And in a sense, that's true, right? We, if we don't obey, then we sin. So it's necessary that we obey. But it really needs to be something that's not a burden to us. If, if we're just over there and we have the Bible and we, and we make us a checklist and say, okay, this is one thing the Bible says I need to do and I did that and something else. See, now, now that's the wrong kind of attitude. We need to obey those things. But it ought to be a response of love toward God. And when I do those things, it's never going to be a burden. It's going to be a joy and a privilege. When I get up Sunday morning, I shouldn't have to decide whether or not I'm going to go to worship. Well, am, I, am I going to go to worship? Well, I know I have to. Is that the attitude we have to have? No. When, when I get up Sunday morning, I don't even think about it. It's understood because I love God that I'm going to go to worship. And that's a response of my love for God. It's not a burden for me to go to worship. Sunday morning, Sunday night, go to Bible class. Sunday morning, Wednesday night, come here for a lectureship. Uh, I like what Jeff said. It's a wonderful thing to come on a Saturday and, and have a lectureship. Some people don't look at it that way. They think it's a burden. See, it's not love. And it goes on. Patience of hope. Patience of hope. That idea of uh, endurance. Hebrews, or rather Romans chapter 5 verse 3 talks about uh, tribulation. And tribulation works what? Patience. And patience, experience, experience, hope. But we have to endure those things that would try to hinder us. And so our, our work of faith, labor of love, patience of hope. These were the works of God. I've never understood people that go to Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8 and, and conclude, see, we're saved by grace only when two verse later says that we're created unto good works. Go to James chapter 1 and verse 25. We go to the perfect law of liberty, not being a, a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. See, we have to be doing, and what, what's the result of being a doer of the work? We're blessed in our deeds. See, there's Smyrna right there. Now, let's make some applications about fellowship here. If we want to be in fellowship with God, then we need to be involved in the work that he has for us to do. Both individually and collectively as a congregation, we're talking here about the congregation of Smyrna. They were involved in the work. God knew their works. And their works were works of righteousness. Now what about other people that maybe not be involved in the work? See, it's doing this if-then thing that, that Brother Danny was doing. Let's look at some, some possibilities. Have, have brethren in our own congregation that just don't want to do anything. They're never involved in the work. They're never in the assembly. Right? Maybe they're doing things that are contrary to the work. What about those brethren? Now see, co collectively speaking as a congregation, if we don't discipline those types of brethren, either by encouragement, trying to, to strengthen them and get them to do what's right. See, that's part of church discipline, that instructive discipline. And then if that doesn't work, we need to, to do what? Well, we need to have some corrected discipline. That means we may need to withdraw fellowship from those brethren that are not involved in the work. Do you realize that we get criticized for withdrawing from people that forsake the assembly? You know, a lot of times I've been in congregations that, oh, we practice church discipline. It's one of the first questions I ask them when I, when I try out at a place and I meet with the brethren there. I said, do you all practice church? Oh, yes. Well, their idea to practice church discipline, the Bible's idea to practice church discipline is two totally different things. Oh, yeah, we withdraw from people that commit adultery. 
But they would never think about somebody that was covetous or somebody that was forsaking the assembly. See, they differentiate and have big sense, little sense. They're not consistent in their application of those passages talk about fellowship. Now, what happens when we have a congregation that fails to discipline its own members? Can they be the church at Smyrna? No. Because part of the work that the congregation has to do, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 5, is what? Purge out the leaven. Because a little leaven leavens the whole lump. There you have uh, what Brother Lester Camp wrote a track on, guilt by association, right? Have brethren among us that are in sin, and if we don't do the work of discipline, that's part of the work, then we sin. 2 John 9 through 11. If we transgress and abide not in the doctrine of Christ, we have not God. There's a line of fellowship that's drawn this far and no farther. And if you go across that line, God doesn't go with you. If you transgress and abide not in the doctrine of Christ, you leave God behind. And if I'm going to be faithful and, 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 and I want to be part of the church at Smyrna, I can't go there. I can't follow you. Because if I follow you across that line of fellowship that God drew, not me, I don't have the authority to draw that line. God drew it. I just need to respect it. Now, when, when somebody crosses that line, one of those other five churches that had negative things, the dead church, we had one church dead. Can we fellowship a church that's dead? Can we fellowship a, a, a congregation that Jesus is on the outside, knocking on the door, trying to get back in? I never understood why some people question whether or not one co congregation can withdraw from another congregation. Somebody else's lecture, sorry. But if Jesus is on the outside knocking, trying to get back in, he's out of fellowship with that kind. Can Smyrna fellowship a congregation that's dead? Can Smyrna fellowship a congregation which Jesus has left? Has, can they fellowship a congregation if Jesus removes the candlestick? Absolutely not. That's not really a hard thing to figure out. Maybe a hard thing to practice. See, that's what the deal is. It's, it's, these principles on fellowship are easy to understand. The Bible's plain on it. What part of have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them, is hard to understand. It, if it said have some fellowship, then we'd have to scratch our head and figure out which fellowship we can have and which fellowship we couldn't have, right? What darkness is old Kelly? Well, it's not written. Have no fellowship. That's easy. If you transgress and abide not in the doctrine of Christ, you have not God. Is that hard to understand? No. Is it hard to understand that if we bid God speed to those people that have departed from the doctrine of Christ, we partake of their evil deeds? Is that hard to understand? Absolutely not. Smyrna understood this. Now I don't know that, that we could ever say for sure, but the implication, the strong implication is that Smyrna would never fellowship another congregation that was out of fellowship with God. They would never do it. And I think it's from this reading that we can say that. Lord knew their tribulation. He knew their tribulation. Many early Christians suffered greatly for the cause of Christ. You know, in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 26, Paul said it would be better to remain unmarried. If you're not married, it would be better to remain unmarried because of this present distress. Because of the tribulation and persecution the church was fixing to go through, it would be better to remain single. To not have the, the care and concern of a family. 
That's the kind of stress they were uh, distress they were going through. First Peter chapter four and verse one, talking about persecution, he says, "Arm yourselves with the same mind, the same mind as Christ." Chapter four and verse twelve, he says, "Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery tribulation, which is to try you, as though some strange thing uh, come happen unto you." The fact of the matter is, we need to expect. We need to expect tribulation in our life. Not just necessarily from, from being faithful Christians, but there's, there's all kind of things that happen to us as we go through life. I especially like the song that Brother Lee Moses sang, uh, led us in before this lesson. Never, never sang that song before. But I, I think that I would count it among my favorites now that I have. I really like the message of that song. Because there could come a time in our lives when just things in life happen to us. And life happens, I'm telling you. Uh, from, a, from personal experience of my own and, and, and as a preacher of, of about 30 years dealing with other people's situations. Things happen and it can really try our faith. It can hinder our spiritual growth, our progress as Christians. It can cause us to, to give up. But James says what? Count it all joy. When you fall, fall into diverse temptations. You know that's hard to, to get isn't it? That's hard to grasp. Because when you're going through it. And the hour's dark. And you seem like you're standing by yourself. And you may be going through things that nobody in this world can help you with. But Peter reminds us. 1 Peter chapter 5 along about verse 6. We need to cast our cares upon Him because He cares for us. Even when we're by ourselves going through something seemingly alone, God is still with us. He cares for us. He knows what we're going through. And He can help us. Not to mention the fact that we have persecution from the brethren. Sometimes we may feel like we're alone there too. I remember Paul's final words to Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 4, when he talks about at his first offense, no one stood with me, but all forsook me. How many gospel preachers have ever felt like that? Probably all of us. Seems like you're the only one standing for the truth. And in that case with Paul, that's what he says. All forsook me. None stood with me. Except the Lord. The Lord stood with him. And delivered him. We're never really alone, folks. Even when it seems like we're alone. They're faithful brethren. There's faithful brethren around. We're not alone. But even when it seems like we're alone, God knows what we're going through. He knows our tribulation. And He cares for us. We can cast our cares for Him. He cares for us. And He'll deliver us. The Lord knew their poverty. Poor financially, but rich spiritually. Both of these were due to persecution. Domitian, Caesar confiscated their property and possessions. Think about that. You know, we live in a, a country that offers us some security from that. You know, a preacher, when he goes into full-time preaching work, might have to give up a lot and has to give up a lot. Because you go to a congregation, once the honeymoon's over, what happens? You preach one of those moving sermons, right, John? Not that you move the audience to, to some spiritual higher plane, but uh, they moved you out of the preacher's house down the road, right? 
just once. I would like it when the preacher and the congregation butted heads that all of the members had to get up and move out of the state. <laughs> just one time. I'm real fortunate. I've been in this congregation in Fish Hatcher Road since 2001. And the brethren there love to hear the truth. I would, I would put them up against Smyrna any day. And I'm not just bragging because I'm trying to butter my toast. I'm just speaking the truth. It's a good bunch of people over there that understand the importance of fellowship and maintaining the truth and defending the truth. And they like that. We have the enemies here identified. You know, there were some that professed to be Jews. And at one time, they were God's people, but that ended at the cross, right? Judaism ended at the cross. So these Jews didn't get the memo, I guess. And so they wanted to stamp out Christianity. And they were trying hard. They were trying their best. They claimed to be Jews, but they really were not. And the Lord said the Jews in Smyrna were not fit to be called Jews anymore. They may have been practicing some of the same things that they should have been. But that is over. Judaism is over. In fact, he goes on and says that they're really of the synagogue of Satan. You know, it may be that some of the Christians at Smyrna were former Jews that converted to Christianity. Now, some of their fellow citizens, you know, from the Jewish nation, are now trying to kill them. Trying to per they're, they're persecuting them. Heavenly persecuting. Synagogue of Satan. Wouldn't it be easy for, you know, maybe there were some friends among those Jews. Maybe there were some, maybe relatives among those Jews. Maybe there were some former associates among those Jews that were now persecuting the church. Wouldn't it be easy just to make peace with them? To compromise? To go along? To get along? But notice, not only were they no longer worthy to be called Jews, but he says they're of the synagogue of Satan. That's kind of like Jesus in John 8 verse 44 saying you are of your father the devil because his works you do. We need to recognize, brethren, that those that turn away from the truth of God's word, for whatever reason, they are of the synagogue of Satan. And some of, some of my former preaching brethren that I held in high esteem are of the synagogue of Satan. We need to recognize that, folks. That these people may have the face of our friends, they may have the face of our family, but behind that face is Satan. And they are the enemy of Christ and all that we hold holy. And we need to stand up to them just like Smyrna stood up to these Jewish people. And if we're going to stand up for the truth, maybe we may have to give up some of our possessions and become those financially impoverished people, but spiritually rich people. It may be that we have to stand alone. We may have to endure persecution. You know the extent of persecution now? I, I remember a while back when we had to split over the Dave Miller issue back in 05. It kind of built up to a head there and, and then popped, I guess. But uh, I remember after that happened, some of the things that were said about those standing for the truth. And I don't know why. I, I was trying to think of some earlier. I should have made a list. I, had a, I used to have, keep a list of those things. But knuckleheads comes to the top of the list. And I remember one former friend and mentor called us vile. And I mean vile. What does that get us? What's that? Toxic loyalty, toxic brotherhood. There you go, toxic brotherhood. What's that? 
Toxic loyalty circle. See, the, the, what does that help? I mean, does that help anything? It's not, it's not studying out the issue. And those people that were slinging those darts would never get up in the pulpit and defend what they believed on those issues. But see, that's what's going to happen to us if we stand up for the truth and we're going to be like the church at Smyrna. Right? We're dealing with the synagogue of Satan. And that kind of gives us an idea where some of that, that, that vehemence came toward us. Has it been 40 minutes already? 35. Only 35. Okay. But that's what we're dealing with. We're dealing with wicked men who say wicked things to cover up their wicked deeds. This is just a, a, a tactic to divert the attention away from them. But it's not a good argument for their position. Still like to see some of those men stand up and defend what they believe on fellowship, but they're never going to do it. Because, and I'll tell you why, and this is my opinion but I think it's an educated opinion. The reason they won't stand up and defend what they believe is because they believe the same thing we do. They just won't practice it. They've written on it. They've spoken on it. They've preached about it. They've lectured on it. Some have written books about it. I think of Robert Taylor. One of the best books on fellowship I've ever read. Listen to him speak. I, probably everybody here, or most of us here have that book. How could a man like Robert Taylor turn from the truth? And I'll tell you what, friends and brethren, we need to be on guard. If, if we think we stand fast, we need to be taking care lest we fall. Because if somebody like Robert Taylor can turn from the truth, anybody can. Anybody can. I mean, that, that's just, I'm not just picking on him. I'm just using him for example because he wrote an outstanding book and then later turned his back on everything he said. And there's other men like that. Other men. Many profess to be Christians who are not. Some dishonor Christ through unholy living, such as 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 1. Have divisions over every little thing in the, in, under the sun. But we have a promise in verse 10. We have the promise of suffering. 2 Timothy 3 and verse 12. Yea, and all they that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. If you're not suffering persecution, is that an indication that maybe you're not living godly in Christ Jesus? Those are people that go along to get along. You will have tribulation 10 days. This is a number symbolizing extreme, extreme and complete tribulation. But notice this suffering was only for a period of time and it would end. There you go, have that idea of endurance and overcoming. Have that patience that we've been talking about. The Lord here is encouraging them not to lose heart. Be faithful to the point of death. Be faithful unto death. Some people look at that and say, well, that just means I need to be faithful from now on. Well, that's true. But this verse means be faithful even if it means giving up your life for the cause of Christ. Don't compromise your faith even if you have to die for it. Are we willing to, to have that kind of faith, to stand up and defend the truth and, and have the right kind of fellowship, even if it costs our life? Then we have the promise of life, a crown of life. 1 Corinthians 9.25, a crown that will last. A crown that will last not only for a small, short time, like the laurel crowns of the Ithmian games, but, but what? A crown that lasts forever. 2 Timothy 4, 7 and 8. Fought a good fight. Finished the course. Kept the faith. See, after Paul had done those things, then he received the crown of life. If, if our Christian life was likened to a, a fight, a boxing match. Paul said, I fought a good fight. If it was likened to what? Uh, I fought a good fight. I've kept the faith. A stewardship. Paul was a good steward. Right? I finished my course. If the life is a race, he finished his course. Henceforth, after he'd done those things. A lot of people want to have that crown of life without putting forth any effort. A lot of people want to have that crown of life even though they compromise the truth and turn away from it. But you just can't have it that way. 
a promise of freedom from death, Revelation 2 and verse 11. The second death is in fact reference to hell, Revelation 20 verse 14. Death means separation. Separation. When we die physically, James 2 and verse 26, our soul separates itself from our body and we experience death. The second death is eternal separation from God. And certainly, if we compromise the truth in any way, especially in the case of our study today in the area of fellowship. <laughs> he even blew it early. <laughs>